A little bit ago, I asked for your dumb Resolve questions. Things that you might just not quite get still with Resolve. Well, let's have a look-see at a couple of those. Whoosh. First question is, how do I upgrade Studio from 17 to 18 beta? Do I need to buy a second key for Studio beta? Long story short, you don't need to buy a new key for Resolve if you already bought Studio 17. It's a free upgrade for 18. All you have to do is just download the Studio version. And if you have a key, that will totally work for 18. If you have a USB dongle thing, that'll totally work for 18. It's not a big deal at all. Next one, what is Ripple Delete and why would I use that over just a blade? Well, what you're probably talking about is Ripple Trim. And what that does in short is it makes a cut on the clip right at the playhead, and then it deletes the first part of the clip if you're going to Ripple Trim Start, and then it moves everything down the timeline like that. If you Ripple Trim End like this, it's kind of doing the same thing, cutting it at the timeline, taking this piece and getting rid of it and moving everything down all in one swell foop. Where normally you would have to do just what I did, you can use ripple trim start or end to playhead by using control shift left bracket for the beginning or control shift right bracket for the end. So it just saves you a bunch of time. It's also very similar to if you hit T and you grab the end of a clip and you were to trim this down like that, pretty much doing that as well. Same difference. Whereas a blade, all it does is just cut a clip right where you click. Next question, why am I so horrible at basic color corrections? Not something you can answer, just think typing. Well, not having seen a bunch of your color corrections, I'll give you a couple common scenarios. First big thing is you might just not understand how color works. It's pretty important to understand how scopes work because this will tell you exactly how bright or dark things are, how strong the colors are, what your white balance is, and that kind of thing. If you don't know how to use scopes, check out this video right here, because that is a pretty foundational thing. Another common thing is that it is a lot easier to color grade an image like this that is shot in log with a decent camera. Long story short, without getting too technical, you have a lot more room to kind of play around and mess with your colors with some nicely shot footage than you would from something more compressed like footage from your phone. Here we have a video I took on my phone. And although you can mess with it, it's pretty hard to make it actually look really good. And although you can mess with something like this, if it doesn't start out high quality, you aren't going to be able to really increase the quality. It's the classic can't polish a turd kind of scenario. Last thing about this, and then we'll move on, is you don't want to overdo your color correction. Just a subtle curve, maybe a little saturation, maybe a little bit of warmth, is sometimes all you need to make something look nice. So here's before and here's after. And a lot of the time what I see people do is, you know, really push this curve and try and oversaturate it and really make things really bright. And this doesn't look good. It doesn't look more stylistic. It just kind of looks worse. So overdoing your color grade is a quick way to make things look bad. Next question, if I record in 4K, make my timeline 1080, then export back to 4K, am I losing quality? I do this for hardware reasons as my laptop won't edit 4K. So right here, I have footage that is shot in over 4K resolution, and we're scaling this down to a 1080p timeline. Is this losing quality right here? Yes, it is. It's still gonna look awesome because generally, if you take 4K footage and you scale it down to 1080, that looks better than just shooting 1080. And if you take this timeline and go to the deliver page and export this at like Ultra HD, know you're technically not getting the very best quality here. In fact, when you hit add to render queue, it's going to tell you that. It said the selected render resolution is higher than the timeline resolution. Rendered images will be upscaled from timeline resolution to the selected resolution. So what this is gonna do is make a 1080p image and then up res that to Ultra HD. If you want to get the very best quality, the way to do that is you can go ahead and edit in 1080 and then go to your timeline in the media pool, right click, go to timelines, timeline settings, uncheck use project settings and set your resolution here. So I can set that to ultra HD. And now what this is doing every time it shows a clip is it's showing this at ultra HD resolution. So if we were to zoom in to 100% or even 200%, we can see this looks okay. If I switch this back to 1080 and make it the same size, it's not quite as good. I don't know if you can tell here on YouTube, but it doesn't look quite as crisp. 
So all of the sizing and everything happens at the timeline level. The good news is almost everything that you do in the timeline will scale appropriately if you change your timeline settings near the end of your project. So I could edit this even in 720p and then switch my timeline settings to Ultra HD and get that full benefit without having to work with a 4K timeline. That said, on some systems, even editing your 4K footage in a 1080p timeline is going to take a ton of resources because you're still working with that full res 4K footage. You're just not rendering out the 4K image. So it might be better to do something like make proxies and make them a quarter resolution and edit them all together and let Resolve switch those out with the full res footage before you render. So hope that answers that. Next question, if I'm recording on a Sony a7 III with no picture profiles and I want to use Alette for faster color corrections, how do you know which one to use and even which one to start from? Well, long story short, Alette will expect a certain kind of input, so a certain kind of image. If you are shooting on the a7 III with no picture profile, if it's just kind of stock, it's probably not going to look like this. It's not gonna be a log image. You're gonna have a Rec. 709 image. So something that looks a little bit more like this, of course, a little higher quality because this is from my phone and an a7 III is a very nice camera, but you're still essentially gonna have things in the image that come in as really dark or black and really bright or white, which means one, that you won't really have a whole lot of room to play around with your colors, but you also won't be that far off from a decent looking image. So if you're just looking for a LUT to stylize things, you can really use any kind of Rec. 709 based LUT. So that's any LUT that expects a image like this that has saturated colors, it has dark darks and white whites, and adds a little bit of style to your image, something like this. And at that point, it's just picking a LUT that you like. There isn't really any kind of technical changes that need to be made to the image. That said, if you are shooting an A7 III, I would really recommend shooting in a log profile like S-Log3 so that it comes in a little bit more like this and you have a little bit of room at the top and bottom of your signal here to kind of push things around and adjust your colors without things clipping. If you do shoot with S-Log3 over at groundcontrol.film under LUTs, under free LUTs, we have all kinds of free LUTs that are available to take that log footage and make it look nice. For instance, this free S-Log3 to Rec. 709 LUT this does a really good job of transforming your footage and taking that kind of gray washed out image and making it look nice with very minimal tweaking. So check that out. We'll also put a link right here and I hope that helps. Next question, how do you copy and paste basic attributes to clips? Like how much you're cropped in or the position or anything like those? Well, let's grab a clip here and let's turn on our transform controls and zoom in. And let's say we want to take this kind of cropping and copy it to another shot. Well, we can select this clip and hit Control C on the keyboard. You can also right click and just say copy and then go to whatever clip we want to apply those changes to. And I can either right click here and paste attributes, or I can just hit Alt V and that'll bring up our paste attributes panel here. And we can decide what attributes to copy in between the clips. So for instance, we want to zoom this in and also copy the position. And as I hit apply, this will apply that same transform as this clip. I can even select a whole bunch of clips and hit Alt V, make sure these things are selected and hit apply. And that will apply to my entire project. Pretty darn handy. Last one. I don't understand creating bins and adding media to the media pool. I've watched videos, but I'm still lost. I have a MacBook pro and I feel like a dummy. I used to use shortcut, but resolve makes shortcut look like a toy. So here's how this works. I'll just open this up in the edit page here. The media pool is where all of our footage for our project lives. And it's actually a little bit more simple than it kind of looks. This main big part, this is where we put any media we want in the project. We can either drag media in here from the Explorer or Finder, or we could also right click and say import media. I'll just pick a couple of pictures and hit open. And those will show up right here. This is where we put any kind of pictures or video or audio or graphics or anything that we want to use kind of as an asset in our project. If we mouse over any of these, they'll kind of give us a little bit of a preview. If we have both of our viewers open here, I'll close this inspector. And if we have live media preview on in the source viewer, if I mouse over any of this footage, it'll pop up in the source viewer and I can kind of preview it. So that's nice. 
And really, you can leave stuff just like this, especially if you have a smaller project, you can just kind of leave stuff here, that's not a big deal. But if you do wanna get a little more organized, you can right click anywhere in this blank space and go to new bin, and that will make a bin, which is just a folder where you put media. And now I can shift select anything that I want to put into this folder and just drag it into there. Now, where this might be confusing is that we're kind of organizing things here, but we're not really organizing them on our system. It's just inside of this project. So we're not actually moving our footage from one spot on our hard drive into a folder that says footage. This only lives inside of the Resolve project. All of this footage and everything that we have in here, that still lives exactly where it did before. In fact, importing footage into Resolve, moving it around, you can put it in 15 bins, but it's still going to live, if I just say open file location, that's still going to live wherever I put it on my system when I copied it from my camera. And again, you can get as crazy detailed or not detailed as you want here. This part here on the left is the bin list, and it's just a nice list where you can quickly go to any of the folders inside of your media pool. You can also just close that and just double click on a folder to open it up. If you wanna go back to the previous folder, you can click on this back button, and now we're back to the master. So I could make a bin for images, and I can drag those into images, and kind of keep organized that way. If I want to rename something, I can just select it and then click on the label here, and then type to rename it. I can put bins inside of bins. So I can put this images bin inside of footage, I can double click on that and open that up, and here I have my images bin. It's really dependent on how you want to organize things, but again, it's just organizing things inside of the media pool inside of Resolve. It's not moving things around on our system. So I hope that clarifies the media pool bins stuff. These are great questions. Thank you guys so much to everybody who uh, responded to that community post. And hey, if you have any more dumb Resolve questions, go ahead and post them in the comments here and I'll be looking for them. Maybe we'll do a volume two. We'll just, we'll just have to see, all right? Here's my dumb Resolve question. Why aren't you using Resolve right now? Yeah, if you're, if you're drinking a lemonade, why aren't you doing that in Resolve? You should have thought about that. That is a dumb question, you can't do that. Can you?